Okay, this is delayed because I'm turning it on. Oh my and, goodness. And yeah, it was a little bit delayed there. Hi, everybody. And if you are able to actually put this in the Metacall group, that would be great. Yeah, I'll do that right now. Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. Hi, 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 hi. Welcome to how to submit a demo. <laughs> Took us a minute with City Blue and Baby Weight. Um, we're really excited to be here today. Um, this is kind of like the finale of our launch weekend for this amazing initiative that has started over the course of the last week. It's been in works for months, but I think we had a really successful launch weekend and so many people are excited to be a part of this group and our community and we're building our community on Metapop right now. It's the numbers of our group is, have jumped up so much. I think we're over a hundred members now of female trans and non-binary artists and all different levels of production. And I think that's important. Beginners, veterans, if you're a veteran, please join so you can um, give tips and tricks to people who are starting out. And then if you're just starting out and you wanna get into production, I think it's super important to join our community because there's so many people there that can help mentor and help and give tips and advice on making music and all that great stuff. Plus we're running all these exciting activations like contests and, and things. But today we are here to talk about submitting demos. And so I made a PDF, I put it into the Metapop group, um, the link, which you can download, it's a Dropbox link. And uh, basically I talked in this PDF about all of the most important things that you need to know in regards to sending a demo. And there is an art to sending a demo, believe it or not. Um, it's actually really important to do certain things uh, when you are sending songs that you made to record labels to try to get them to sign. So here, I'm going to actually probably share my screen maybe. I think that would probably be smart, eh? So everybody who's watching this video can see it just in case somebody doesn't have the, um, the uh, PDF. So why don't I do that? Make sense? Okay. Okay. Share. Can people see my screen? I'm hoping. It's a bunch of stuff <laughs> outside of, okay. You are sharing your screen. I don't know if that's working. I can see it. You can? Okay. I mean, I can see it on Zoom. Yeah. Is that what I'm supposed to be seeing? Yeah, yeah. You're supposed to see. All right, cool. Perfect. Okay. So here we go. Let's go into this. So, and I would love to, you know, and Kara, like if you have anything, you know, feedback on any of this stuff, yeah. jump in at any point. Um, so first of all, it's really important when you are starting out uh, before you've even made the song even. I think it's really important to do your research and think about, be honest with yourself and think about what kind of song you are going to make, what kind of genre of music you're gonna produce, what kind of an artist do you wanna be? All of that stuff is really important to think about before you even make the music. Usually when I go into the studio and I start making music, I'm already thinking about what label I wanna send the track to. And I think it's important because labels these days, they have a specific sound that they like to sign. Like they don't just sign random things of all multi-genres. I mean, I guess some labels do that, but like for the most part in electronic music, the big labels that are doing really well, that are in the top 10 on Beatport, the labels that we're gonna be working with in these record contests, uh, remix contest, they all have a significant sound. Um, and they're looking for that sound in their demos, in their remixes. So when you're doing the remixes, please think about this as well. Um, so I'm just going to go through these points. So do your research. I just said that. What is your sound? Figure out the type of music you want to make and make a list of your favorite labels. I actually on a thing on the wall over here, I have a list of my favorite labels on the wall. And I also have a list of a spreadsheet that um, I 
have of the top labels that I want to sign on in each genre. I think it's important. Um, and if you cross genres, if you're an artist that crosses genres, um, so I'm a, I'm a genre crosser for sure. I play multi different uh, sounds of house music. I play melodic sometimes and I play tech house, but that's okay. It's kind of important to get your own sound, but if you're playing like, or making, one second drum and bass and the next second you make techno it's maybe a good idea and you want to take both of those those production careers further I think it might be important to get an alias if you're going to do that because it will be confusing to the public and to your audience if you're one second making drum and bass and the next second you're making deep house um so what I'm just saying here is if, if you cross genres that are not far from each other, that's fine. Anybody can do what they want. But if you are just starting out, stay in the same ballpark. If you are making drum and bass one minute and hard techno the next, it's best to get different aliases for these sounds. I recommend sticking with one sound and getting good at it. Uh, but if you want to cross genres that are extremely far apart from each other, make a couple aliases. Kara, you pretty much have your own sound. Yeah, um, so I would say, I think you strike upon some very good things here. Um, specifically, I think when you are getting ready to submit a demo to any label, you should have a good inkling as to what kind of records they're known for signing, um, what their current release slate looks like, what their release slate from the last year or so has looked like as well. Um, because that can be a, a really good litmus test to see maybe what kind of demos they're currently accepting at the moment. That being said, and this is full disclosure, and like to those of you who are like, yes, I'm going to get something signed today and it's going to be fabulous. We love to see it. I love that kind of confidence. However, keep in mind that if you're submitting to a label like Tool Room or Dirty Bird or Desert Hearts or even my own label, um, Chub Rub, like the normal window from time that it's signed to time that it's released is going to be anywhere from a few months to upwards of like a year and a half, two years. Yeah. So like you have to be cognizant of the fact that people that are signing records they're not signing records for what they want to put out now they're signing records for what they want to be putting out a year from now yeah uh, a year and a half from now so like you kind of when you're actively producing you kind of have to do this like Doctor Strange Machiavellian kind of thing where you have to predict maybe what the next move is um, because um, the records that are coming out today are things that have been signed maybe a year ago and, or uh, like let's say six months to a year and by the time it comes out the A&R for that record label might be already sick of some of the trends that they're hearing and they're just like, I want to hear something new. So yeah. um, don't be beholden to um, any one genre, but just be like, like aware that the labels that you're sending these things, that, that you're sending your demos to, have probably heard a few demos that sound exactly like this. And so you, you just need to... Um, have an upfront contract with yourself upon submission of that demo that maybe what you're submitting is is uh dated already by the time that it even even if it's like something that sounds fresh and current and new it might already be dated by the time it comes out so like you just need to keep that in the back of your mind yeah. and as far as having other aliases I would say in today's day and age, I'm going to like agree and disagree with you. I would say in today's day and age, especially with artists like Justin Jay, for example, um, 
you can experiment a little bit more. I feel like COVID and being stuck indoors has freed up our creativity in a lot of ways that allows us to experiment. Um, that being said, um, if you are trying to um, streamline your your production, especially like right when you're starting, it's probably best to get really good at one style um, and then kind of move on to other things. So yeah. that way you can already learn things like song structure, like um, uh, arrangement, um, different kind of um, sound design techniques. Um, because like once you get really good at producing house music, then it's literally just like a sidestep to like drum and bass. Like you can then take everything that you've learned about one thing once you've become really proficient at it and apply a, a lot of those skills to a new thing. And then as far as like when you play out, there's nothing keeping you from being multi-genre like when you're playing shows, but yeah. people expect a little bit more consistency I would say um so I would argue that an artist like Justin Martin for example who loves drum and bass will dip his toe into drum and bass during his live shows especially if he has you know more than one hour to play around um however people know him primarily as a house artist first who just so happens to have a love, affinity, and um, uh, skill set that applies to drum and bass as well. So yeah. it's like you're kind of setting an upfront contract as well with the people that are coming to your shows. So you want to be thinking about not just what labels you want to be sending your records to, but like what you would be playing out to a crowd. Because if the answer to that question is like, oh, I primarily play house music. 95% of the stuff I make is house. Like 95% of the stuff that's in my crate is house. You should probably be producing house. Like I would reckon that's the smart, the smart play for you. Yeah. Um, even before you start submitting demos. And then feel free to experiment from there. Yeah. I, um, I'm going to have a lot of long-winded responses so to the people in the chat okay that are like man this bitch can talk <laughs> just understand like yeah she knows she's got the gift of gab so like i i'm well aware just that's why i invited you here <laughs> yeah it's just like i'm gonna i'm just gonna sit back i'm just gonna be on autopilot for a moment just yeah no, feedback is good. And like, yeah, you don't have to take every single thing that I say, like, I per personally think like, I don't know, like it, sometimes it's good if you're making one complete opposite sound than the other and alias is good. That's how it's often been done. But I agree with you that things are changing. I mean, I'm glad. And by the way, I hope they change because I really enjoy playing um, indie dance and uh, melodic stuff and like people have really pegged me as a tech house artist and so like I don't like that I want to be able to go out and play any dance and melodic if I want to so I agree I really hope that people are more open to being a multi-genre artist okay so I'm going to keep going here yeah. um once again be honest with yourself you may be a huge fan of Adam Bear but that doesn't mean he's going to sign your vocal tech house track to drum code it would be better to try for example tool room or desert hearts back to the research of the labels thing um because i play a di few different genres of house i have a spreadsheet with all of my favorite labels in a google document okay and basically i go through them when i'm reaching out to these record labels and i want to send them off um i divide them by genres if they are like different kinds of house music like i have a melodic um tab and i have a house and tech house tab because those are usually if i make a house or tech house record label I'll send it to for example for me I'll send it to Desert Hearts I'll send it to Rothentic Dirty Bird and and whatnot so that's a good idea to do that um also you can put the A&R contacts of the 
because uh, you're going to have so many A&R contacts if you have a big list and it's good to keep tabs on all of that. So, and if you can actually accumulate real people who run the A&R, sometimes it's harder than um, said than done. And we'll go into that later in this document, but it's always good to have a real person for an A&R contact outside of like info at toolroom.com kind of thing. Um, uh, research your labels even more. Go back and listen to the last 10 months of releases. We just talked about that. Check out their SoundCloud, check out the artists they sign and make sure this is the sound of the record that you want to make or have already made. Often it helps to even take a sample record. Okay, so this is when you're making the track, um, but it's, it's a good idea to do. So whoever's making remixes right now for Tool Room, often it helps to take a sample of the record from the label that you know that you wanna make uh, put it in track one of your projects, like on Ableton or Logic, and use it as a reference track. Don't copy the record, <laughs> but like use it as a reference track. Reference tracks are really good to have when you're making a tune and you want to say, I'm going to make a record for Tool Room today. Have like one of their most recent Tool Room tracks in the um, track one of your project. It's good to just have something as a reference, just on just to look at, okay, like where do they kind of like, do the different drops here? How long of records are they signing? Like things like that. It's 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 actually useful. Can I add something to that? Yeah. Um. So, a lot of record labels will also have their own in-house mixing and mastering. I would say that in addition to that, it's useful to have that in your DAW of choice, be it Ableton Logic, whatever. Um. Simply because, um you're going to find that the way that some labels mix or master their stuff is to taste. And so there's no uniform uh, mixing and mastering amongst all of these labels. And so like you might notice that like a Desert Hearts um, uh, uh, mix and master um, might have a little bit more uh, low end in like a very specific sub frequency. And so like, um having things like that so that it's it's not just like uniform in terms of the arrangement but also in terms of the mix um is super useful as well because then to the a r that's listening to it it's like oh this person understands kind of like how how we layer our our things not just from an arrangement standpoint but from like a sonic one as well um and i've come to find that that's been a super useful tool for me in terms of getting my own record signed to some other labels um because then the a and r at that point doesn't have to do the extra leg work of then having to um do a super extensive uh mix with their in-house engineer and then they just have to worry about a um getting a really solid pre-master to then get um, mastered in-house. So um, just like a little bit of a, a stepping stone technique, if you will. Um, uh, so there's that. And obviously, as I'm, I'm sure a lot of people in the Metapop group, as, as they hone their skills producing, especially if they're just starting out, um, we could talk about sample selection and how that influences um, what label you should send it to because like a 909, one type of 909 kick um, that would do very well for say like a defected release, that same 909 is not going to um, hit uh, Barclay at uh, Dirty Bird the same way that it would hit like let's say Simon Dunmore at Defected and so yeah. like you have to you have to understand that like it comes down to those choices as well and so having um, having a reference track in there and kind of like trying to mimic the the tonality of some of the the drum choices um, and EQ choices is going to be just as important as things like um, uh, where where you put your hats, which sixteenths, what the swing sounds like, um, what kind of pads are they using? Um, is is everything primarily being done in operator on Ableton, or are you using something more extensive, like say like an Arturia uh, Moog or something? So I'm I'm 
sure I'm speaking another language to a lot of people right now, but um, these are all things that you have to start considering, like when you are like making something and you then have to pitch it to a label. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. It's, it's more like just the, the basics of it is do your research on the record labels, get to know the sound of the label, get to know what they've released recently. And then the next level is it of it is everything that you just discussed. Like what kind of drums do Dirty Bird usually have on their releases? What kind of drums do Soma Records and Drum Code release for their techno release? Like there's, there's like a, a madness to it all, a method and a madness to it all. So it's good to know uh, at least the basics, which is what have they released lately? And then when you're ready to start really getting into, you know, your production to a next level, start understanding exactly what you said, the tonality of their recent releases, and that'll help you even more. Okay, so the track's done and you want to get it signed. Okay, so this is important. Uh, send more than one track, first and foremost. Um, make an EP. Labels do not like, I mean, you can, you can send one track. It's not a rule in life, but, and I have done it before I've sent one track and I've gotten it signed, but for the most part, I mean, I Demure did a whole video. He does great um, in advice uh, YouTube videos on his channel about like what he's looking for when submitting demos and things like that as a record label owner. And one of, he did an entire video on don't send one one track. <laughs> and basically it's important because you want to give them something to choose from. I think more than three might be too much. Four is okay. Anything more than four, you're, you're, you, these people get sent so many demos. Um, you just want to send your best two or three, I think. And basically um, put them, basically get the A&R rep's email. That's another important thing. Like I said here, easier said than done. It always takes, it's always best to get a personal email. Sometimes this takes investigating. If you know someone that is affiliated with the label, you can ask them, but it's best you feel really comfortable with this person to ask for a personal email. Like for example, if everybody just asked me right now, hey, can you give me Hudson City 2's email address? I would say, no. <laughs> Because yeah, okay. So that's I'm what I would send out email addresses of my friend who's a big DJ and probably gets thousands of emails every day. But like the most important thing here is there's a way to obtain these email addresses. Usually it's through personal relationships with the actual people. Or if you really feel like you're really close to somebody at the label, ask them. It's better than info at needevensound.com. But really important though, the, the info at needevensound.com, info at dirtybird.com, those demo emails, some, some of these websites even have like uploading forms on their websites. They get listened to. It takes weeks though. That's the thing. So first and foremost, try to get a person. If you can't get a person, just go the regular route and then wait for a response. Sometimes they won't give you feedback. Sometimes they won't give you a response. But, um, you know, it's okay to do one follow-up maybe, but that's, it's important to um, try to gather at least the emails in the, of the a and reps first or at least the demo uh, emails. And then you can have them all in your spreadsheet and it'll be a go-to. Like I said, right here, and then you can chime in, uh, Kara. Demo emails take weeks sometimes to get back. Often they don't get back at all. Follow-ups after a couple of weeks are okay. You can ask for feedback. Not everybody gives feedback, but I think they should if they, um, and sometimes they don't have time, but if I personally think for women in trans and non-binary heirs, they should be giving feedback, uh, but it's the reality is they don't. So uh, send an email maybe two weeks later or three weeks later, if you see it's been listened to once or downloaded, um, or if it hasn't been listened to, you can also follow up and say, hey, I sent you this uh, demo a couple of weeks ago, just wanted to see if you had checked it yet, even though you know that they haven't, because you can see in the, the private link, and uh, maybe that'll give them a little nudge to listen. So, sorry, be back. Um, yeah, I would say um, all really good sound advice. Um, I the one definitely don't send one track at a time and and i would say i would even go so far as to personalize like especially if you're se sending via soundcloud you'll notice like when you're submitting demos some labels are very specific like no google drive links only dropbox or soundcloud you know things like that first and foremost 
read those. Don't just assume that people are going to want MP3s. Some record labels are very specific and they only want like demos given to them in wave format with like a very specific like file name like artist track and then like something else after that yeah so, you know be cognizant of those things um i only said waves yeah i don't yeah. um <laughs> <laughs> i i learned the hard way that like some people prefer mp3s um and you know like you, you just have have to be ready for those curveballs and just have things at the ready. Um, so like I usually wind up exporting or bouncing my masters, my self masters um, uh, as both a wave and an MP3, just so that I have both, like just in case. Um, and the wave is uploaded by default to SoundCloud if I'm using a SoundCloud link, but then I have the MP3 in Dropbox, just in case if like, you know, the A&R is like, hey, send this, you know, we, we're looking for demos, you know, send it to us in this format, then it's like, okay, cool, I already have that. Um, that being said, um, I would I would also co-sign on the personal email thing, because just like, think about, it's not personal, and like, it's not gatekeeping like nobody's going out of their way to like avoid listening to your demo um and i think we like sometimes get this like story in our head that like it, the the um, these gates are put in front of us specifically to hinder us and that's 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 not true at all um I just want younger people or people that are just starting out to consider how many spam emails do you get on a daily basis that you have to comb through to get to like important stuff and then apply that to your job. And then imagine like if you gave out your purse, if you worked a &R at Dirty Bird, for example, Imagine if you gave out your personal work email, the amount of hungry artists and producers that would come through the gate. Yeah. And like, that is too much for any one person to deal with, which is why, you know, when you're submitting demos to Dirty Bird, they have that submission um, through uh, label works or demo works. Um, and there's a lot of other labels who use that as well. And I actually think it's a very good tool. Um, it allows you to, and we're about to go into this as well in terms of yeah. like personalizing your submission. It allows you to share a little bit more about um, you as an individual versus you as the artist. Um, and like, I'm actually gonna like hop, skip and jump and like skip to the next thing. When you're personalizing your message to these people, be a human being. Don't like be like, be like, hey, you need to sign this because you're a quirky, weird label and I'm a quirky, weird person. Like, no, <laughs> like nobody wants to hear that. If you sent me something for Chub Rub today, like I get, okay, so we use a Google Doc similar to like what Black Book uses. And if the amount of people that send me something where it's just like, why do you think you should be a part of our family? And it's, it's like a sentence that's just like, cause you guys are fun or because you're quirky, just like me. That's no, I'm, I'm, I will listen to the demo, but I will immediately discount that because like, I, I'm not asking you to like impress me. I'm like asking you to like actually share a little bit about yourself. Um, literally be yourself don't give me your whole life story about how your cat named samantha got stuck in a tree when you were seven or, or you played or, fiddle as a child <laughs> yeah like you know like cool um that's not what i'm asking for i'm like asking you to like share the parts about you that like why would i want to sign you yeah that like make you different from other people so like for example um you know, when I first started out sending demos on my own, it was all things like, um, 
hey, I think you might really like this track. It's been getting really good feedback from X, Y, and Z. Um, they've been playing it out. Um, a little, a little bit thing, a little thing about me is, um, my best friend has described me as a really pretty human dumpster fire. Um, <laughs> take that as you will, just like something that's, that's unique and memorable and, and speaks to you as a person, because that is what people will remember the most is that impression, um, and we get a lot of stock answers, just like all the time. If yeah. you tell me that your record belongs on my label because it's weird and quirky, you could literally say the same thing about 12 other record labels at the moment right now. Um, it's just it, like, it, it just feels haphazard. Um, yeah. And uh, additionally, like, I wouldn't mob people, give people some time to, like, move through their emails. There are demos from, like, two or three months ago in the email, like, in the, in the inbox for my record label that I haven't listened to yet because I've been super busy. And I have two other people helping me at my record label. There's, it's literally three of us doing like a ton of work. Huge labels like Dirty Bird, I think as of right now, their staff is like seven or eight people, two of which are Andy and Barclay. Barclay is a full time touring DJ who has to make his own music. Um, and Andy is the COO and is like, is handling the day to day. And so that leaves like four or five other people to do the work of like a record label arguably i would say they're almost as big as like say like a spin and deep or an armada or an ultra like in terms of popularity so they're having to do the work of that like maybe a dozen or a couple dozen people have to do on a daily basis is like split up between like five people i think tool room said once that they got about a thousand demos a week yeah so and if you get a thousand demos a week, like you need to be patient for them to go through it. You need to at least give them two weeks, at least two weeks before you do a follow-up. It's okay to do one follow-up, um, two, mm, I would like, I would two, maybe two after a month or two, but if you see that they still haven't listened to it, maybe, but if they haven't listened to it after a month or two, like you should be maybe sending it to somebody else to check yeah. out. Um, and um, then additionally to the next point, um, because I see this. Um, the one thing I hate more than anything else is when somebody sends me a SoundCloud link, they really talk up the release. They're like, this has been killing it on every dance floor. It's getting co-signs from Elton John. Um Every time it gets played, <laughs> glitter pours out of people's tear ducts. It's an amazing. And then I go to click on that and it's like, oops, this track can't be found because that tells me that you just sent that track to 50 other people on CC or BCC and it got picked up by another label. And like, and so, so I'm sorry that producer is now on my shit list. And I, and I would say that this is very typical of a very specific age group. Yeah. Okay. Um, Wait, sorry. And I'm just being an old lady, just yelling at the wind. We're going to get to that part so. though. That's, that's a little, that's the next one. So let's go, let's start. <laughs> I just don't want to miss this one part here about the personalizing. Okay. We yeah. basically just said all this though. Personalize your emails, write a short professional, but also casual email to the A&R. <sighs> If you can find their name, perfect. If not, just say, hey there. Uh, sending in my track in for consideration, and I'm going to get to this example, okay? Do not send one bulk email, we just said this also, uh, to a bunch of people on CC. No one legit wants to listen to that. 
you do not want to share emails with other people. That's another big thing. I don't, I still to this day do not understand people who send bulk emails with a whole bunch of people on CC. You can also get your email flagged for spam for that. So uh, XNA on the bulk emails, send one individual. You shouldn't be sending a track anyways to 15 people at once because if you're lucky enough to have like a few people interested, you don't want to deal with that uh, problem of, like, I mean, it's a great problem to have if a bunch of people want to sign your record, but I mean, I usually stick to a few at once and I don't let the other people know that I'm sending it to the other people. You want those people to feel special. You want them to think that they have received your record and they're the only people that have received your record. Okay. Do not DM your tracks to artists on Facebook or Twitter, uh, an email, keep it to an email, keep it short. These labels get so many demos just said this, do no one has time to read your extended bio. Um, don't send attachments. Always use a private SoundCloud link. More on this below. We'll get to the SoundCloud thing in a sec. Um, here's an example of an email I recently sent Affect when I was reaching out and not knowing him at all. I literally sent this email within the last month. His response was really cool and he got back within 24 hours. I mean, I, I really, I made a melodic kind of like indie dance sounding record and I'm just kind of new at making that music. I've only made a few. And, um, pretty proud of the EP. Um, and I said, Hey there, I'd like to submit this e EP to Syncopat. I'm on Katarmuka, Native and Sound, Desert Hearts and Perspectives Digital. These are all other record labels that have melodic sounds on them. I wouldn't say I'm on Tool Room because uh, Syncopat doesn't care if I'm on Tool Room because they are not a tech house label. So I only use examples of other melodic indie dance labels that have that deep sound similar to syncopat okay and then i said i'm a big fan of the label saying that you are into what they do is important um he appreciated this and i love affect's new album on mobile he just released an album it's really good and he got back one of the first things he said when he responded to me was thank you so much for saying that about my album <laughs> so the fact that you show you are showing them that you are paying attention to what they do that is important because then they will know that you're actually tuning in you know to what what's going on with the record label let me know what you think thanks sydney then i said here's a video of me playing the second tune electric island festival in toronto canada I only send videos of me playing. I, I've done this a couple times now. I only send videos of me playing the track if it's really impressive and you see like hundreds or thousands of people with their hands in the air going off. Do not send a video of yourself playing a record in front of like a small tiny bar with five people dancing. I don't, that's not going to impress them. These people usually play for thousands of people themselves every weekend. So that a video like that won't do anything. However, like I said, this video of me playing at Electric Island, there was like thousands of people. And it was right when the drop went off and people were jumping up and down with their hands in the air. It, it was impressive. And then also, like I said, keep in mind, I only put the video link there because I was playing it at a festival with thousands of people going nuts. If you have something like this, testing your track out, it can help. I recently signed an EP to Desert Hearts showing myself playing the tracks at an after hours with people going crazy. It's proven the pudding that the track was off. Don't send a video of five people dancing in front of your track. If you want to blow them away and, but um, do this, but the video is not necessary. Ultimately, they will likely want to test your track out themselves anyways, to see how it goes off in their sets. But it's just a little like tidbit information thing that you can do if you like want to show them what it, what the crowd does. And like I said, it got that, I signed the whole EP to Desert Hearts because I sent Marbs the uh, full video of me playing both tracks and he was like, wow, and he signed it right away. So it, it helps, but I was playing, hundreds of people were, were dancing in front of it. Do a follow up in a couple of weeks, but don't bug them. It is worth following up if you have not heard back for feedback, but once is fine. Okay, now we're on SoundCloud, which is where, where you wanted to give, um, chat uh, feedback about but yeah I'll just I'll just read this really quick and then you can chime in SoundCloud always use a private link SoundCloud is basically the industry standard for sending demos you can send it on the upload form which if they request it do that if you can also send it on Dropbox the problem with sending links Dropbox links is you are never going to know if they listen and this is why SoundCloud is like 95% of the time the way that most people 
uh, send demos. It's how uh, the labels want to receive the demos. And it's best for you as the artist because they will uh, see, uh, you can see if they have listened or not. You can see if they've downloaded it or not, and you can see how many times they've listened. Um, make the uploads private. That should be known, but make sure you do that. Make the tracks downloadable. See, there's a screenshot here. See where it says enable direct downloads. Make sure their downloads loadable. That's really important. That's a great sign if they've downloaded it because that means they want to test it usually at their, their sets. Um, and tick off enable uh, comments and display stats. Okay, this is really important because if you are sending the same link to multiple labels, you do not want them to see that other people have listened. So if you click off display stats, they will not see the number of people who have listened to this and you can send it to multiple people. Okay, you, once again, you want them to feel special and finally make a set playlist. And if, um, if it's two tracks for the EP, like a little playlist, private playlist, make that private too. Okay, so what what did you want to chime in about that, Karen? Um, I, you hit all the, the talking points on the head. I, um, we do this with um, all of my stuff as well. Um, I'm a little bit of an asshole. I do keep uh, comments enabled, but I don't keep, I check off display comments. Uh, pr reason being is that I've come to find that like, because the comments aren't displayed, um, it gives some a &R reps an opportunity to leave small pieces of feedback. Like, for example, like, we like this, but would prefer you to like, you know, make the intro a little cleaner or something like that. Um, That's fine, but yeah. make sure the other label doesn't see that. Like, make sure you make a separate link then because you don't want to send, you don't want like tool room to say that in the comment and then you send the same link to. Well, I was, I was like, oh, tool room turned it down. Like you I was, I was under the impression that if you had enable comments turned on, but display comments turned off, it allowed oh, it allowed the person to leave a comment, but no one else would see it aside from you. Right. Okay. Fair enough. I that makes sense actually. Yeah. That makes sense. So um again, I could be completely off on that, but uh, <laughs> I would be paranoid. <laughs> yeah, but like that's I mean, that's how I've I've done it and and so far I haven't hit any any major snags. Um I think it's brilliant to always, always, when you're submitting things to uh, labels, especially multiple labels at the same time, do not put everything into a playlist that's like December 2021 demos and send to everybody. Um, if you make individual playlists for each uh, group um, and they open it and they're just like, oh, this is just for psycho disco or oh this is just for this ain't bristol or you know um oh this is just for compact like what happens is is that person goes like okay they took the extra time and energy to make something succinct for me um yeah that's that's all i really have have to say about that um Nothing is more frustrating, though, than, and sometimes you might have to do this. I've come to find that sometimes tracks that nobody wanted to sign like a year ago, two years ago, all of a sudden people want to sign now, either because the, the, the landscape has changed in some way sonically, and so what I was making two, three years ago is all of a sudden like really hot right now. And that's just the kind of records they want. Do not send a demo if it says that it's been on your SoundCloud profile for like a year yeah, or totally. two years. If you want to start resubmitting that demo again, take it down, upload a new one. Exactly. Like it's, 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 it's that simple. Delete yeah. the old one, bring in the old, bring in the new one. Yeah. And um because people are people aren't dumb. If 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 they see that something's been on your SoundCloud profile for eight months, 
No, exactly. Like it's they're going to be like, this has been on here for eight months. Yeah. Um, like, really quick. I, I just want to fi- read this last couple points and then do you want to check to see if there's any questions? Maybe? Yeah, we actually have a couple. Okay. So I'm just going to finish this because we don't want to go over into Rebecca's talk, which is starting in six minutes. So yeah. finally optics, have you got your socials in order? Make sure they're all up to date. Try to get some followers. Make sure there's like links to your social media at the bottom of, you know, your signature and your email when you send it off. Make sure your SoundCloud looks good. Make sure Facebook and Instagram look good because they might want to check you out. And if it's a mess, they, that will be not good in your favor. So just make, get some followers, you know what I mean? Make sure everything's consistent, get a little branding going. And that's a whole other discussion. Maybe we can do another talk on that in the next few weeks or something like that or next year, because I think social media is important. Um, Make sure your email is has your artist name in it make sure it's not something like partygirl69 at gmail.com um this is important have an email that has something to do with your artist name uh make sure everything is labeled properly so they can reach you i did a instagram live the other day with native instruments and the first thing that um we had a whole demo discussion as well and she said a lot of the record labels get um sent tracks with no names on them and they don't even know who sent them i don't know how you can not know who sent it if they sent you an email maybe they dm them or something like that i don't know but apparently i guess like if it's not labeled and it's downloaded and it doesn't have the name you're trying to figure out yeah where exactly it's probably like an id3 tag or something where yeah, it's like the, exactly. the file name's not labeled properly um so make sure you do that. Just make sure you're reachable and everything's good. So, okay. What are the questions? Let's answer some questions. Um, so the first, the, uh, um, it looks like we have a question from Zara. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Um, when submitting a demo, does it need to be mastered or should one send a minus six DB pre-master? I don't think you should send a minus 60 B. I think you should do a self master and then send it to them and give it the option. If they want to uh, master it themselves, then send them the pre-master. Yeah. So like I understand. Okay. So this is what I'm going to say is that like, if a label really, really likes the track and you send them the pre-master, like, okay, fine. Nine times out of 10 though slap a limiter on that bad girl and just yeah. and and just put it in because ultimately um the person on the other end wants to be able to like kind of get a good idea not a perfect idea but a good idea of what it could sound like when it's as loud as other um other tracks um i would say one of the best tools for that is iZone 9. I understand that it's not in everybody's price point. Um, it is a, it's not a cheap plugin. Um, Isotope does not, it's, it's, it's expensive and it's, it's, um, it's out of reach of some people, but if you can afford it, there are few plugins in your arsenal that are as, um, as productive as having the the isotope uh nine ozone bundle yeah. Yeah. um because like that uh that um uh i forget what it's called a master assistant where you can upload a reference track and have it come pretty close to what another track sounds like in terms of like levels is is such a useful tool i use it artists like steve darko use it um vanessa uses it like a ton a ton of us use this tool um because it gets it to like 95 percent, and then most of the time people will go like oh this is dope this is sick whatever or they'll yeah or they'll be like or or they'll be like oh send us we really like how it sounds, but we'd like to make a few tweaks. So send us yeah. a master. Yeah. Um, I, I, I took your master for your release. I like, I released your own master. I do that often. If I think that the master is good enough, I'll just release it. A lot of labels yeah. do. Yeah. So, any other um, questions really quick before? Cause I don't want to go into Rebecca's talk. 
Um, well, they said that um, the person who asked that question said they have a cheaper version sometimes. It's it's uh, it's even free. Okay. So I, I would say keep an eye out um, on the Ozone 9. I know that when they were getting ready to launch Ozone 9, they gave out Ozone 8 for free. Um, so just always keep an eye out on the isotope stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I do, I, I know that we only have a couple minutes, but I we were talking about this before we even started the chat. And, and, yeah. and I do want to mention this. Um, in the Metapop chat, uh, a couple of trans artists uh, and DJs um, were speaking about having fears about um, being themselves in, 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 in a club setting um, due to fears of violence. Um, as a trans woman myself who presented as cis male for most of my life, um, but was closeted, um, you see a lot of, there is a lot of toxic masculine energy in house music right now. It's, it, it, you can't not notice it. Um, and the only way that you could be ignoring it is if you come from like a place where it doesn't permeate your everyday existence. Um, and it's really disappointing. And um, uh, it's, it's, it's a sign of how, in a lot of ways, the bro culture that came from like big stage EDM acts has kind of permeated into more underground spaces. It's up to us to set the tone. As, as the people who create the spaces, as the people who perform at these spaces, as the people who are the, the pillars of this community. Um, and so I would say that just because there's, you should never live in fear of being who you are. Period, the end, full stop. Being a trans person, you are going to live a life of violence. That is, it, it's just our existence. We have to be constantly prepared for anyone to over overstep. And clubs are, 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 are should be a home for us. And if those people want to come in and, um, be deranged and destroy that space um they don't belong there and it should be up to the people who are maintaining that space be it the promoter the people running the club the bouncers the managers whatever to then take the responsibility and if they are not taking the responsibility it is then up to us to ask or rather demand them to do better and so I would say in the face of this undercurrent of, of toxic masculine energy and, and homophobic and transphobic and, and racist energy that's happening in dance music that we have to, that we have to address, quite frankly, um, don't let the other people win. Be yourself. Um, because believe it or not, there are more people in the room who will love you and support you and stand up for you than the, than the one or two vocal pieces of garbage um, that are also occupying that space. Yeah. So. And yeah, that's important. Making so, our environment safe. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's where I come from. Um, and like, I've seen some transphobia um, since coming out um, in the music industry, um, in the music space. Um, a lot of it is just misguided people who are not exposed to, to uh, the trans community on a daily basis. And so they're just overreaching in search for answers. They're trying to understand, they're trying to grasp the concept. Um, and they make up the majority, but there is a there is a, a a group of people who are out to 
make it known that they feel the space is for them, even though it wasn't created for them. It was created for largely queer um, and, and BIPOC people Absolutely. Um, uh, to, to feel like they could escape the uh, pressures and, 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 and fears and, and societal norms that are put on them. Absolutely. So um, be yourself even, even in the, um, the wake and, 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 and um, very ever present um, potential for for something bad to happen because if if you're not being yourself it's a disservice to you it's a disservice to the people who love you who care about you and if you're an artist it's it's a disservice to the people who look up to you either as fans or as peers or because you're not sharing you're not truly sharing who you are and um people want to be with you they don't want to be with some husk some um um, shallow version of who you really are. So that's all I really have to say about that. I'm sorry if it was very long winded or kind of all over the place. Um, if you have more, if you want to talk about it with me more, hit me up in the Metapop group. I'd be more than happy to chat. Slide into my DMs on Instagram. I want to hear your stories. I want to be here for any trans or non binary or gender diverse people that are. Um, into what we're doing. Um, and so, yes, please. Um, I'm here to listen. I'm here to help. Awesome. And this is a great segue into Rebecca's discussion because she's going to be talking about safety in our industry as well, which I think is super important. And yeah. this is why we have this group too on Metapop is so we can have these kind of discussions and feel safe and we can say whatever we want amongst ourselves and how we're feeling about the industry and how it's treating us. I think we've all been in situations where we haven't felt comfortable due to the way certain people have made us feel. So anyways, this was a really great discussion and I hope everybody takes away for it as much as they can from the um, demo advice. If you have any questions about the PDF that I uploaded with the link and or if you have any questions about what we talked about today, please shoot me a message um, in the Metapop group, or you can also comment on faith on YouTube because this is being streamed live on YouTube. Um, and I'm happy to respond to anybody um, with any questions and we'll leave it off here. Rebecca's up next and uh, yeah, thanks for doing this with me. Of course. Ah. Okay, I'm gonna stop streaming now. Um, see you guys very soon. And hold on actually.